Now, most of us consider ballpoint pens as writing instruments only, but not Jacqueline Sowari. She creates her visual art through th thousands of ballpoint pen strokes, which make up every single piece of her work. She's here to speak on her new book and solo exhibition. But first, let's take a look at her work. I've always liked working where there's nobody to disturb me and ask me plenty of questions. But now I have to get used to working with people asking questions because I think people are fascinated by watching an artist create art. I like to see people who do things that are extraordinary, who are not ashamed or afraid to be labeled crazy or weird. For me, it connotes a certain level of boldness. People who are brave enough to be themselves when it comes to identity and appearance are the real superheroes. There's this fire in me that's wanting me to gear off into all sorts of forms of art. And I, I, don't, I don't know for sure what it might look like, but I'm excited to find out. These pieces are literally timeless. They're amazing. Really excited to be at Jacqueline's exhibition. And I'm really proud of her, the amount of work she put in. She puts her soul into her artwork. The combination of words and, uh, and pictures is really, really interesting. The way her paintings or her bodies of work come to life, um, only for me to come close to it today and realize that, oh my God, it's all, it's, it's pet. I've been here for a minute and I've looked at literally everything they have here today. And it's just, you know, it's breathtaking. The fact that she uses something different from other people. It's a really nice experience. It's really something to see. Oh, that's captivating stuff there. Well, Jacqueline Swari joins us in the studio. She creates her visual art through thousands of ballpoint pen strokes, as OG rightfully introduced there. Uh, that was amazing to look at. First and foremost, a huge congratulation. One looks Thanks. like a very successful, another successful exhibition. Thanks. Seems to have uh, developed such a great following here in Lagos um, as it pertains to your art. Using a ballpoint, pe ballpoint pens, <laughs> we're all familiar with them. We all use them. And like, you know, doodling here and there when you're in class or even in a meeting, I, I can imagine that many people are used to doing that. But using a ballpoint pen to create these beautiful images, first and foremost, what made you think, well, let me use this material as opposed to paint or pencil or whatever the case may be? I trained traditionally as an artist. And then when I, I was always drawing with the ballpoint pen in school, I think that most of us have done that, like behind our exercise books and stuff. But then when I got into the university, they said that it wasn't a traditional art material. So I just like dumped it. But after school, I picked it up again. And then I, I just loved the way the works come out, the skin, the flesh tones, the way I'm able to you know, use crisp lines and the contrast that the ballpoint pen gives me. So I decided to just explore the possibilities that could possibly come out of it. And then I landed here. <laughs> Your story is quite unique. I, I know you started uh, painting or drawing at the age of five. Yes, I did. And I'd also first like to congratulate, uh, congratulate you on your new book, which takes about 10 years of your work, right? Yes, yes. Uh, talk to us about that and where you're going from there with the book. Um, so I felt like there was the need, the very important need to... I don't want to create art that is just beautiful. I want to create art that changes people's lives, that transcends from just the painting on the wall to so your actual human life and, you know, inspire people to make decisions, to do things the right way from my art. I believe that the work of an artist is like that of a doctor or a priest, you know, someone that finds problems and prefers solutions. So with the book, I felt that I needed to get people professionals, you know, who could talk about my work, because as an artist, you create work, but you also need people like curators and professors in the arts to look at your work and say, this is where your work is going and this is what it's talking about, as opposed to what you think personally. Because I could create a painting and I could ask you, OG, what do you think about this painting? And you say something totally different from what was in my mind. 
So, first of all, I felt the need to do that. Then secondly, to document it. One of the things that is missing in the art scene, especially with us in Nigeria here, which is one of the reasons why we don't even have enough documentation of our histories, is, docu is physical documentation of work. And I felt like, okay, this is 10 years of my career. I should document it because the next 10 years are going to be definitely different from what I've already done now. And so that's why I decided, okay, let me put my time together and create this book and make sure that it's done to the, I mean, I created it with love, that's what I like to say, with so much love and perfection. Then at the end of the day, I also want the proceeds from the book to go to my arts foundation. So I have an arts foundation that I founded when I was a copper. I know how I struggled to raise the money to pay for that CAC thing then, but then that was about 11 years ago. And coincidentally too, this is, this is also a landmark for the foundation. And um, what we do in the foundation is we focus on children, five to 15. That is when the, the talent is raw. That is when they're open to people, you know, people's opinions, telling them, oh, you shouldn't do this. Why are you drawing? Don't draw. Go and sleep. Go and study. You know, those, those things that people tell most children who start drawing, who are fascinated, who just find out, oh my God, I can draw. I love to draw. You know, so I try to, with my foundation, encourage younger children, encourage their parents, you know, tell them this is something that people can, they, they can actually be somebody by following their dreams. But a lot of the times, parents unconsciously yank that talent from their children because they feel like they want them to be better. I think at the end of the day, every parent just wants their child to succeed. So if you understand that there's actually a platform where your child can learn, can be nurtured, can thrive, I think that parents will be more open to letting their children study fine art or to be artists. And so that's what the foundation is generally focused on. In the past 10 years, I have personally on my own, you know, trained close to 20, 30 people, you know, directly, indirectly, especially little children and teenagers and IT students. But then I want to take it large scale with the, with the proceeds from the book from next year, I intend to, you know, make it bigger so that people can you know, it's one thing to you, you don't light a lamp and put it under the table. Right. You have to put it out there so people can, more people can get involved. More artists who are also committed to that cause can get involved because these things didn't exist when I was growing up. And I feel like if I'm able to achieve that, then that is something very important. Oh, well done. <laughs> Thank you. So it's not the Af uh, African Artists Foundation mm. you're referring to? No, no, no. no. My, my own foundation oh. is the Passion for Arts Initiative. But oh, well, you I have see. your book yes. at the African. Yeah, but the book was launched at the African Artists Foundation, foundation. here in Lagos. Yes. I see. Yes. So, so the book basically documents what you've done for 10 years. Yes. How will you... Apart from using ballpoint pens, what mm -hmm. was the was the soul of your work? I know the artists hate to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hate to describe their work, but then you've documented something, mm -hmm. um, and you did say that you like to um, reach out, you know, uh, uh, if you like, preach with your work. So, if you had to put it in a sentence, what does your work communicate? Hmm. Two things. Yeah. So it's not one sentence. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is, I want my work to be able to speak to a person's true identity. I want people to be able to, from my work, get inspired to be their most authentic self. The truth is, everybody's walking around trying to mimic or copy somebody else. Yeah. And it's not, because, it's not because they feel like, oh, being themselves is wrong. It's because they're afraid that if they actually try to follow their dreams or be themselves, they might get judgment from society. Mm. And I mean, everybody has gone through that phase. I, when I was five, I know how when people gather and ask, what do you want to study in school? And I say, I want to draw. They used to look at me like I was crazy. I look at my parents like, do you know what your daughter is saying? You know, and that's one of the things that happens in society. So people have dreams. I mean, you see someone who is in, who is in law school, who really loves cartooning, yeah. who wants to be a cartoonist. Right. But because if he says it outside, he won't be taken seriously. He will just bottle it in. So I want my work to, first of all, push people to say, see, take the step. I know it's risky, but just put your feet in the water. You know, just try. Mm. You know how that, um, 
analogy from the Bible where the children of Israel put their feet in the river Jordan and then the water started to part. If you don't put your feet in the water, you will, you will find a way. You can't stand outside and be saying, oh, this water should part, this water should part. You know? So that's the first thing. Be your true self. And then the second thing is I want my work to be able to, I want people, other artists to realize that you shouldn't box your creativity. So I started out as a painter. Traditionally, that's what I trained at in school. Then I said, realizing that I want to draw. And so I started drawing and I abandoned like the act of traditional painting completely. And then I now found out during the lockdown that I really, I really like to perform. Like I, I love performance art. And so I was like, okay. And then I love to sculpt too. And I was like, okay, this idea came and I want to sculpt. And then this idea came and I want to make video art. And now, so I'm doing painting, sculpture, installation art. I'm doing um, video art and I'm writing, you know, and these are things that I always am passionate about, but I just felt ah, I'm an artist, I'm a painter, so let me just stick to that. Mm. But the way the world is now, God has given you all these talents, you might as well use them. So I, I put them all together in my work. So whenever I'm presenting an exhibition, I do all those things, and then I give you the Jacqueline Sowari experience. That's what I call it now, because I can't just box myself, but I'm mostly inspired by my drawings. That's where it all starts from. The drawings will create the poetry, which will create the performance, which will create the video. So that's, that's the, those are the two messages I want my work to, to tell people. You know, second, just especially for artists, that second one, don't box your creativity. Whatever your heart is telling, yeah. taking you to, that's where you should be going. Yeah, basically. Great, 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 great so story. I Thank you. imagine that there's almost two groups of artists, people who know that that's something that their heart desires, but for whatever reasons, they may not um, go there. You mentioned somebody wanting to go into animation, but perhaps staying in another uh, career path because of how they feel they would be received. So you've got that group of people. And then I guess you've got other groups of people, much like yourself, who are... Uh, confident and steadfast in their uh, creative abilities and want to c continue dedicating their life and professional career to art. Um, it is obviously Art Week. I believe it's called Art X. Yes. And it's a wonderful showcase of what is on offer in terms of Nigerian artists. But I'd imagine that that hasn't always been the case. And that could have been a reason why you'd see in recent decades, perhaps a little bit of an exodus of Nigerian arts artists going to other countries in order to be appreciated. Do you think with the coming of um, installations and celebrations like Art X, more Nigerian artists are likely to stay in the country and continue cultivating this culture here in Nigeria? Most definitely, most definitely. So in the last four years, we've experienced some sort of boom in Nigeria. And that's also because we've gotten a lot of appreciation from the international scene where our art is concerned. So it's, it's just like the spotlight is on Nigeria right now. And then this creates an enabling environment. Everything thrives when there's, when there's a market for it. And Nigerian artists, I feel like the more the, and then thanks to social media and then the lockdown. There's something that happened during the lockdown. Everybody was trapped inside and so we, we were forced to look at our phones. We were forced to find entertainment outside. Yeah. And people now found out that they had, oh wow, I like arts. And then we got new people, you know, looking at artist pages and patronizing artists. And so the world is a global village and right now the spotlight is in Nigeria, especially our artists, our music, everything that we are creating. And I feel like the more these opportunities arise, the more people will see this thing as something that is lucrative. Everybody was created with something special, whether it's art, whether it's something, everybody came with something. And the more everybody's able to harness it, it's like their superpower. I can't do new, I can't do broadcasting like you. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I can. I don't think I can. You know, we all came with something special. And if everybody is in their niche, I feel like the world would be a better place. Yeah, you're a mm. definitely multi-talented. Yeah. <laughs> we all know that. Now, when you talk about the Jacqueline Sawari experience, mm -hmm. you are a sculptor, a sculptor as well. Yeah. Yes. I did see that you did something to kind of shine the light to the NSAS movement. Talk yes. to us about that. Um, that is a very emotional topic for me because I know how, how I felt, how I felt during the whole thing, how helpless I felt at the end of it. And one of the things that my work speaks to is stereotyping. I don't believe people should be stereotyped based off of their looks. You, should, you can't judge a person's character by their appearance. 
a person's character is like the fruit of a tree. You judge the fruit, you judge the tree by the fruit that it presents. You don't know a tree is decaying until you see a decayed fruit, or you see that it doesn't even fruit at all. So you can't like see people and judge them and say because this person is wearing black and black, or because this person has dreaded hair, or because this person looks some sort of some kind of way that me I don't look like or that I don't fancy. That means that person is a bad person. And you know, during the NSAS thing, that was like the crust of the matter, stereotyping. Stop stereotyping people. You don't put people in a box and say, because they look like this, because they appear like this, that means they are like this. Do proper research, do investigation, don't just, you know, that's, so for me, that was something really personal. And then I also, so I created that work, it was like, a sculpture, a piece of performance, and a painting, three in one, you know, dedicated to that cause. Just, you know, basically telling, just talking to, speaking to how the media can be used as something, instead of being used as a tool that is manipulative, it can be used as something that, you know, comforts and consoles and influences people in the right direction. You know, if we have media that is showing people that see, the fact that this person looks like this doesn't make him a bad person. Most people believe what they see on TV, and they will believe that subliminal is subliminal programming. And so that the installation was speaking to how the media can be used to make things better, as opposed to you know just constantly giving people negative images. The reason why people in other countries look at Nigerians and think, ah, Nigerians are this and Nigerians are that, is because that's all they see about Nigeria. Right. So if we change the narrative, and that onus is on us, every single Nigerian, if you change the narrative and make people realize that there's more, there's better, and don't believe that if you see Nigeria looking like this, that means they're like this, you know, that, that, that makes things easier, especially for people coming, younger people coming, you know, to be free and just express themselves in their own style. Nigerians are very stylish people, and so I emphasize that of my work. Nigerians are very, we like to, we like this unique sense of identity. I emphasize that in my work. You know, I, I like to just change the narrative. You know, we shouldn't just be shipping out negativity and even spreading negativity within ourselves. I, as a person, sometimes I fall short. You know how you can be a pastor preaching and then you, you know that you're falling short of your message. Right. Sometimes I, I unconsciously stereotype people. And that's because from when you're little, there are all these things being drummed into your head. My five-year-old daughter one day told me that um, somebody was a bad person. And I asked her why. And she said, because the person is wearing black and black. And I'm wow. like, how does somebody, how, does, how do you say somebody is a bad person? And I, I was so shocked. I didn't even know where she got that from. And I was like, you know what? Baby, people who are bad are people who do bad things. Mommy wears black and black, don't, doesn't mommy? And she said, yeah, mommy wears black and black. Like, is mommy bad? She's like, no. I'm like, so what makes you think somebody else wearing black and black is bad? And she's like, somebody told me in school. Oh. You know, so that, those are things that are drummed in your head from when you're little. And I feel like every parent has a responsibility to, from, from when your child is young, you know, remove all those stereotyping. Stereotyping is, you can't be angry with the system that they're stereotyping. You're part of the problem, yeah. you know. And so I feel like there's a constant cleansing that we have to keep doing as individuals. And so that was almost like a introspection, like, okay, so I'm looking at this problem. It exists. I should cleanse my mind, and we all should cleanse our Very minds. Very well said. And your daughter is following in your footsteps, isn't she? <laughs> she's an artist, no? No, she's not an artist, yeah. but she loves to draw when I'm drawing, too. So, so you never know. I never know. <laughs> well, Jacqueline, I, I know that um, exhibitions help. You know, they do help. Mm -hmm. But then how, what's the art market like now in Nigeria, particularly for young artists, the sort of artists that you're mentoring? Mm -hmm. uh, because at the point, after passion, you know, passion has to bring in, you know, revenue, yes. you know, <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Is this something that um, people should also consider when they want to, um, you know, embrace their passion and say, yes, I'd like to be an artist. Yes, I'd like to go to the uni and read fine art. Yes, I'd like to, you know, um, uh, blossom uh, in this creative world. But then is this something that can, um, that you, that, 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 that can be lucrative, I mean. Okay, so let me just say, art is a very lucrative business. It's very lucrative, there's a lot of money in the art market. But the thing is, you can't just wake up and just enter and then become successful. Mm. You have to be willing to do the work. You have to be willing to do what it takes. I have been practicing for 10 years, and it's only like within the last few years that I can say, oh, I'm very comfortable, I can pay all my bills, I can do this, I can do that. But it wasn't always like that. Yeah. 
when I was, there were times when I had to teach lessons, you know. So the thing is, you have to put your vision in mind. This is my vision. This is where I want to be in the next five years. How do I get there without compromising where I want to be? Because you can start off by saying, oh, let me take a side job because the side job would help. I got, when I finished school, I got a lot of offers, like job offers, because I was the second best graduating student in my class. Wow. So I got a lot of job offers, but I was like, no, I don't want to work. I want to focus on my art. And that was because I know myself. I'm very, like, I'm very just, I have this laser, laser beam focus. If I take a side job, I will not paint again. Mm. You know, so you have to first of all know yourself. If you take a side job, will you still be able to paint? Some people can. And so if you can, I advise that you do that. So you, the side job for, um, provide the finances to fund your passion. Because the materials for painting are expensive. A lot of the things are imported. They're not things that you can readily find on the streets, you know. Although people are being very creative nowadays and creating art from different things. But then the focus is how do you fund that passion? So you have to find a way. For me, I was taking lessons. I used to teach lessons. Sometimes I would even offer free classes, you know, so that at least you see that I can do this. Then you now call me back later and offer me money mm. to do it more, you know. So there are different ways to, especially as a beginner, and then always try to put enough effort into getting better at your skill. I have a very good friend, Indini Mefele. Indini tells me, she says, I can never forget, she told me this thing in 2012. She says, Jacqueline, talent, um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Mm. That's what she told me. And it stuck to my head because, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm gifted, so I should be successful. You have to put in the work. You have to be willing to put in the work. Make sure you're better. Make sure if there's something better than you, you have not, you just keep getting better and better and better and better. And then by that, by so doing, there's no way that your being good will be ignored. Sometimes, it, sometimes the opportunity might not come to you. You go to the opportunity. Sure. There are times when I offered free services. Oh, um, you're doing this project. Okay, I can do this for you. I'm actually an artist. I can do this. I can, do, I can provide, or oh, I can even um, well, can be a consultant. What, what is it that you know, inspires you to commission a work? Like, mm. What is it that makes you say, oh, I can do this for you? Um, okay, so the thing is, um, first of all, when I was doing that, I don't really do that anymore. Now I just by myself, you know, focus on my, from inside, you know. Yes. But when you're starting out, you are trying to feed, you're trying to put food on your table, you look for how you can be a solution provider. You know, so you can, maybe for example, you can find out, oh, this person has this program, and maybe their set is not, artist, um, it's not like beautiful enough. You can come and say, oh, please, I am an artist too. I can give you advice on this and this and that. And then they'll say, eh, what can you really do? People don't really know until they see it. So you say, ah, you know, do this sketch, create the thing. And they'll be like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. And that person refers you to another person. So artists have to find a way to be, to be solution providers, especially in the beginning. Before you can now say, okay, I now have my studio. I'm doing my own work. I'm not, I, don't, I don't really take commission pieces. You know, you have to find a way to provide solutions. You have to find, you go to schools, tell them, oh, I can do this. I can organize this. I can do that. You know, just, that's what I did anyway. That's Daddy, what I did. Before we let you go, where can we <laughs> find your work? Okay, so currently my work, you can find my work at the, at the African Artists Foundation. You can also find my work at the Avant Gallery in New York. And then very soon there'll be more like information on easier Thank access you. places, but definitely <laughs> online. If you contact me online, you found my work. Well, Thank, you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Show. It has been and a wonderful you. experience. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you very much.